Hello and welcome to another episode of Datum. Ravi, how are you doing? I'm good. I've, I've moved my office around, so I'm kind of jarred. I sort of rotated it last night in a in a moment of, could this fit in it down the way? And then I did it and <laughs> I'm just going to leave it for a few days and see how, how I feel about it. I did notice you're facing me slightly from an angle. We're just, we're just using FaceTime uh, for everyone who's listening. And he's looking slightly differently. Normally you used to look the other way basically yeah 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 right. yeah it, it, it sort of rotated backwards i've now got my window in front of me so i get the natural light on me i think it works nicely with the um, overhead lighting but let's not talk about decor are you optimizing for your web camera <laughs> <laughs> um in a way yeah right. lighting actually. to your face yeah, yeah exactly exactly <laughs> gotta be that natural light it's amazing how everyone in their home has basically changed their layout to just glorify the window the window is the greatest source of light we all have <laughs> yeah no absolutely it's always fun like seeing everyone's like um what's the word uh make makeshift like uh standing desk or yeah you know, just yeah. their height like putting the putting the screens on a book and all exactly stuff, exactly so. yeah so it's, it's a little bit interesting fun to see people set up people have to make best uh best do of what they have right absolutely absolutely good work so we're back after a double whammy of uh, live streams last week um uh how do you how do you mm -hmm. find conference let's start with that uh, how do you find conference? I mean, conference, I feel, was the same in yeah. many, many ways. Like, mm -hmm. I still still felt exhausted after every day for different reasons. So I wasn't on my feet all day and with bright lights and air conditioning. Yeah. Um, but it was more of a, you know, the screen fatigue more than anything. Um, right. I, I right. really enjoyed it in, 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 in a different way. I think, you know, there's, there's plenty of places to talk about the conference experience and reflections and all that. But I think the meat of it, which is what we got stuck into, uh, was really eye-opening, I thought. Yeah, yeah, it was very good. Like I actually found it um, refreshing because exactly that I had the comfort of being at home. Uh, I, you know, I optimized for conference. I had a, a screen which just had conference running basically all along, and then um, I was actually doing a bit of consulting at the same time in, in, on some of the days. So I basically just did the American conference where I basically did conference from five until about midnight. So I watched all the broadcasts in the American time zone, mm -hmm. even though it's actually really hard to do that. Feedback for next year, Tableau. But yes, um, you know, it was it was probably the better way to do it. There weren't any spoilers the next morning when I got up um, <laughs> because I was watching it in the right time zone, as it were. And yeah, it was really good. Definitely a lot to learn from. I think um, it felt like a lot of it was pre-recorded all, all the way to Invis, which felt a little yeah. bit uh, not ideal. I mean, you could tell Invis was pre-recorded and yet they had live voting. So what they what they had to have done is they had to have recorded multiple endings and then played the correct ending based on the phone vote. The way you know it was rec <laughs> <laughs> the way you know yeah, it was recorded yeah, yeah. is because um the uh the cues, the visual cues just would not have worked had they all been yeah. in different places. And also, or, or it's just a sick producer, just someone who's just got a massive desk <laughs> and just like pressing buttons, swapping cameras. Right, right, right. I mean, typically something like that, what you'd actually do is you get everyone in a studio in one place, then you'd live stream yeah. it from that, right? But there's no way you could With have live streamed it from seven, eight different places um, at the same time. Across the world as well. Across the world to all of us as well. So it had to be pre-recorded and basically a uh, good bit of video mixing live, play the right outcome once you got the votes in. I don't think many people from the UK voted though, because you know we just don't do text voting. That's not something we do. Like, right? You normally download an app yeah, and yeah, vote yeah. if you do this kind of thing. So that maybe sort of hindered the UK contestants a little bit. But uh, well, I mean, I mean, you know, in, in terms of the actual vote counting, it counts for a right. little bit. It doesn't count for the most, right? The most is coming from the judges, and and I think true. I think it it, it I, I, you know if we if we're going to talk about this, we, you know, in my opinion, the safest viz one. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's a really good viz. I I, I it was a bit of me. It was yeah. a really good, clean, simple biz that's easy yeah. to follow. So I, yeah. I really liked it. I know a few other people had different opinions, but um, yeah. no, I, I think I'd agree with you. I think the my, my my insider knowledge of recording my session is, yeah, it was recorded. Um, so we had a hard window to to fit everything in. Yeah. Um, as, well, as well as the, the panel that I was on, uh, that was also pre-recorded. So I think in order to get the, the advert breaks and make sure that people are in the right place, minimize dropping of people you have to do bits and pieces like that which yeah. i i think i'm okay with that i think i'm okay with that in, in the covid world i mean my, my conference overall was just brain dates and doctor sessions as well as keynotes that's it right, uh, right. i don't think i didn't catch any of the sessions really um well or at least i didn't really pay attention to any um because i it's it, it but like i said in that way it was the same as conference because i think me and you do a similar thing where we don't go to many sessions at all yeah, yeah. um 
so yeah it, it was good it was it was good i enjoyed that part how do you good. find the the streaming of the keynote the yeah along? the the our live stream was good fun i actually really enjoyed it um it was really it was really challenging because uh you know, with with these things, we, well, I think sometimes it can come across look looking like we, we sort of planned this and it was really organized. No, we kind of agreed to it. Really do it really wasn't like a day before. Minutes before. <laughs> a day before, well, we and then we, to... like, we we firmed it fifteen minutes before. <laughs> I yeah, spent exactly. the previous it, day it, basically it, making sure that it was actually something we could do, and but I didn't do enough research because clearly when we started the live stream, I had like. A completely different voice because my microphone was in the wrong was in the wrong frequency. Just or Rick, like Rick Ross over here, she's like, "Whoa!" <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who knows? It might be the same issue with this podcast. I haven't. I didn't actually check. So <laughs> that that would be quite funny. That would be quite funny that if that's the good. case. I'll put the episode out either way. Um, and yeah, that was really good fun. I really enjoyed it. Two two two, two nights. So I wish we'd almost done a third one. We should have actually done Iron Viz a little bit. I think. Um, I I, th- I think if, if I'd known Iron Viz would have had so many pauses and silences and uh i don't want to say cheap gags but sort of iron viz gags yeah i think we would have done it i I would have been more than happy to do it because i think it would have been the alternative commentary right as in like okay yeah yeah, that we're just getting the overview blah blah exactly and again if you want to actually listen to it don't listen to our (laughs) watch along because we are just going to talk over it have it open in another window (laughs) yeah so that was really good fun i thoroughly enjoyed it definitely do it again um next year uh, i'm sure i'm assuming next year will still be remote so um yeah at least i think most people will be remote even if i say conference does have a physical presence i don't think everyone will be comfortable traveling to it so there must for be sure. some sort of live um element to it so that looking really forward to that um it was an interesting one for features though wasn't it because i think if you weren't paying attention you'd think there wasn't much announced right and i think this is it dare i say i think a lot of people maybe walked away feeling underwhelmed mm-hmm yeah, and and in reality, I, I wasn't. I, mean, I, I was delighted. Right? Neither like, was there's I. So yeah. many. Good, so, yeah, I think there's so many good little things uh, that quality of life features. There wasn't. I think the thing that people didn't didn't get was a massive flagship feature. You know, last year there was there was two almost right. You had right. dynamic parameters, uh, and there was something else as well. Um, and you, you just had two blockbuster features, and it was yeah. just like data model, a proper yeah. data model. Right, the crowd went wild. Sort yeah. of sort of situation. Whereas this one was. It was back to back. You didn't really have time to absorb and react. I think there was exactly. a couple of things that we missed as well um, when we were recapping at the end of the second watch along. Right. But in general, I think the, the features were geared towards the direction. And it's one of these things where I think the first conference I went to, um, I put out a thing to, internally when I was at the information lab being like, hey, w- what's the best way to absorb a keynote? And, and I think it was Craig who said, what you got to listen for is not what they're saying. But like listening between the lines, almost like seeing between the lines, right? What, they, what 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 are the words that they're saying, and what they actually mean in terms of direction, right? And you know, for, for example, spending an entire what five minutes talking about Tableau CRM, yeah, uh, take uh, usurping Einstein was a big deal. It yeah. talks about direction, prep in browser, a big deal. We think yeah. about direction, yeah, right level security again in the web, yeah, all of these things that they're, they're, they're saying different in the things, web. yeah, yeah. The whole conference was basically just like in the web, in the web. In the web, in the web, in the yeah. web, in the web, in the web, in the web. <laughs> Are you getting it yet? Are you getting it yet? <laughs> the entire the entire desktop experience in the web. You can have your own in the web. space in, in the, web. the web. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you want a new feature? Where is it coming? In the web. Like <laughs> in the web. <laughs> they should do that next year. That, that right. should be the thing. Right. That is just the whole conference next year. And so, yeah, absolutely. If you didn't read between the lines, actually what this keynote was about was we are moving to a world where you just experience Tableau through the browser. And here's the key thing. It didn't really say it in the conference, but we are going to provide you that experience, whether you want it on premise or in our cloud, we'll do it for you and we'll make it easy for you to manage, monitor and look after. And by the way, if you want the creme de la creme of uh, this experience, there's different tiers of involvement and you know licensing that you can have as a viewer, creator, whatever, or as a server admin who wants a data management add-on and you know all this other goodness and, and so on and so forth. So really sort of driving that message home. No, exactly. And I think the, the really interesting part for me was there's a lot of the, a lot of the stuff, like for example, one of the stuff features that was uh, misconstrued a bit was giving users the ability to do custom schedules. Right. And like you just t- you just heard every cyber admin just burst into tears and like exactly throwing yeah. things around, but in reality, what the feature is is for site admins to set custom schedules, right? 
It was yeah. users of yeah. schedules, not, yeah. you know, the, the same permissions exist where you, a, a normal role within a tablet yeah. server can't set their own schedule. Not, not, now, not only that, not only that, it's not even for on-premise. This is for a tablet no. online where you can't set exactly. schedules, right? So and, 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 this, and this is it. it. It's one of these features where you're like, if you, again, if you're listening close enough, you start to notice, hang on a second. Yeah. This isn't for on-premise. This is for online. Yeah. And again, yeah. where, where is online hosted? It's in the cloud. Which yeah. was, What is the cloud? Yeah. In the browser, yeah. on the web. 100%, 100%. I think next year is the first year where the best Tableau experience is no longer on-prem Tableau. It's entirely in Tableau's own claim. cloud. Exactly. No, it is. No, it's, it's definitely true. Look at Tableau Online today. I think in the Tableau Online instances I've had access to, including my own test instance, it's always been up. It's never been down, right? So, like True. Fact, fact number one. Fact number two, I have access to everything current. All the new features are available to me instantly. So again, in terms of user experience and into my user experience, it's the best place to be. Next year, prepping the browser, uh, spaces, all of these innovations are targeted at the browser and on-prem services simply can't scale up their resources to meet these new features. Whereas something like Tableau Correct. Online will be able to just bring that online instantly for everyone without worrying about the resources. I think you'll get on-prem server admins now starting to complain about, ah, oh, but what is the impact on all these resources? Well, in, in the real world, you don't have to worry about that because in a cloud-centric model, you just scale it up and scale it down on an as-need basis. So the, I mean, the, the thing that always, always, always comes back is performance, right? Like when, right. when, I, when you talk to the Joe Blogs, Jane Doe, average Tableau user, Right. Not, not. I'm not talking front five years Rose conference. I'm talking the generic business user who is just building right. tables, bars, pies that have filter actions right. and the tablet normal color palette, and they're right. getting their insights. Now, when when they come to you and say my my dashboard's slow when you're building in browser, what what can an admin do? Nothing. Right. It's it's those things that I'm really intrigued to see how they solve. It's performance challenges when you're in browser, and I see I've seen this with a few other tools like you know you've got. Your your Power BI in browser, you've got even yeah. Tableau in browser currently. Uh, you've got your Google Data Studio, uh, Quick Sight, and when you play with these, you you start to notice lag when you get to a certain volume of data or a certain thing you're trying to do in terms of yeah. compute power. Mm -hmm. Now Tableau in itself, under the hood, is an in-memory tool. Right. So when you're saying I've got multiple concurrent users working with big data in memory, how does that scale? Right, and I think that's what a lot of people start to consider now. Again, the fundamental question underneath all of this is how many people are using Tableau correctly anyway? And, and by correctly, I mean to its full potential where you're exploring and you're, the, the Tableau flow is yours to own. Yeah, yeah. Most people aren't. Right? Yeah, I agree, got, yeah. The, the pyramid of users of creator, explorer, viewer is segmented that way because that is genuinely the, the consumer triangle within mm -hmm. Tableau, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because... I was, I was, I was, I'm, well, I wasn't going to, I am going to push back on the question about performance, which is why should it matter? Why should it matter to the user, the performance of the thing they're building, right? Like when you get an iPhone, you don't wonder whether the camera is going to be able to take photos fast enough. You just trust that it does and it just works. It's, <laughs> it's up to, it's up to Apple to make sure that the overall experience works the way True. it does, yeah, yeah. right? And so yeah, that's fair. This, this sort of perspective where, you know, server admins always want to ask about the performance. Well, in real terms, why are they even wasting their time worrying about performance? That shouldn't be something they worry about. What they should be worrying about is sort of becoming the stewards of the platform, promoting best practice. And actually, that's a challenge that Tableau should take away from the server admin to free them up to do things that they find sort of more pressing. If you go to, you know, other products that we use day in, day out, you, you don't have someone at Google wondering about, you know, whether Google search... <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> is going to be able to perform. Is Google for search going to be fast enough? Exactly, right? Think, like that is just inherently Google part works. of the, you know, you and I don't worry about that when we go in and start typing. True. Uh, the server admin for Google also doesn't worry about it because his platform scales up and down to meet the demand so the performance is always suitable. And that is the promise yeah. of the cloud, right? Actually, that question goes away because when the computer is so cheap and it can scale up and down to meet the performance that's required, that's what matters, not having a capped level of resources, then asking, oh, given these resources, what's the performance? Well, of course it's going to be limited, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And that's where Tableau yeah, Online yeah, yeah. really comes in. And, and I think I think, I think this, this comes back to some of the bits where, you know, you're talking about 
I think I think there's the, the pushback you're gonna get when everything moves online is gonna be from the purists, right? We talk. I think we've talked to you mean the old hats, uh, right? one of the devs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we've talked to one of the devs. I think it was Philippos we had a chat to, right? And we were talking about the generations, right? Right. You've yeah. got your pre eight crew. That's you, right? Pre eight. Pre eight. Yeah. 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 Then, then you got me, which is like nine. I I'm, I'd say I'm nine to t- ten five. Right. You've got nine nine to ten five is the second batch of generations nah, nah. there's a there's a group between uh version pre-8 i think it's actually pre-8 yeah pre-6. okay i'll give you that there's pre-8 then there's 8 to 10 then there's 10 yeah. to 20 then there's 20 to today yeah yeah so i, th- I think i think 2018 one yeah no wait it's not even 2018 one it's 2018 two because you had the hop to tsm That's true the line there. true i mean right. but who really like come on server admins moaned about that but that doesn't sure. really tw- mean tw- 2018 users. right right so, so the new the new day of data, we've got the new roles and all of these different things right. as well. Sub so subs, subscriptions coming in, yeah. And and then the next jump is twenty twenty dot one when you get the data model, right? Correct, yeah, yeah. And and these are your four generations of users. Now, for the you like this this is where you get the, it is when people wistfully say, oh yeah, but you, I remember when I had to do what the LODs with table calcs. It's exactly. like yeah, but you don't anymore. Don't Why have are to you anymore. telling me this? Yeah, exactly. It doesn't yeah. matter. It's much better. It doesn't matter. Performant. In fact, if you took so, today's so, Tableau and gave it the feature set of like four years ago, it could probably run the nastiest table on the planet like X hundred yeah. times faster, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think that when we talk about those generations, firstly, I just want to make the point that, you know, that most new users will not care. Don't care. Whether they're browser first or they're desktop first. They just want to get to Insight. Done. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, number one, done. And number two, the, the users who will actually migrate we'll just get used to it, right? And I think this is where Tableau forgets how good it is, like them as a, as, as a, as a company. Yeah. Where you, you know, you, it is the best in class exploration tool and delivery tool. You know, they, they, um, I think, yeah. who is it? Um, Fra- Francois mentioned this thing that Anna Casey came up with, which is data is a team sport, right? And the other, the other catchphrase was, was broader and deeper, which is Tableau is almost as close to an end-to-end platform as can be in yeah. the current world without yeah. getting into computing, right? Yeah. If you're just talking about data analytics, end-to-end Tableau is there. And data as a team sort means that you, you're not just servicing the first five rows, the power users, the, the pre-9 crowd, you're servicing everyone, right? Yeah. You're trying to make it as accessible as possible through features like Ask Data, Explain Data. Yeah. And suddenly the problem doesn't become how do we compete with your Power BI's and all of these in the space. The problem becomes how do I empower my users to ask better questions correct right and get answers and get answers mm-hmm. exactly and and the the tough thing as well the tough thing i i always i think we get too drawn in on sort of how can we make how can we build better dashboards right and that's not actually what we're yeah. building what we're actually building is how can you make it easy to find the correct answer to any question that correct. the user has right correct but too often as users and authors, we get drawn into this question about better dashboards. And actually, if you were to rebuild Tableau today from that perspective, you actually wouldn't technically need an author, right? That's sort of going full circle to something we spoke about earlier on, right? Like if actually all you needed was answers, then why do you need an author? And it goes back to the point where you're talking about, which is it's a team sport. Authors are good at bringing together business sort of internal intelligence about a data set together with the data yeah. literacy of that company and packaging it in a way that's sort of amenable and sort of uh, digestible. And then when there's a problem with that, there's actually a person you can interact with rather than just a statistic that's been thrown at you. So so th- this this is quite an interesting topic and I really want to dig into it because it, w- it's, it was one of the ones that I came up with during, uh, it was a brain data hosted, right? Uh, which was off a thread that w- sent me on all sorts of directions, which was <laughs> if you build a, if you, if you end up building a dashboard, yeah. you failed as a analytics provider because you're the second right. you build a dashboard, yeah, you're saying I don't know, I don't know the answer, but I think this is what you want, right? You've not, right. you've not gone deep enough into the user requirements, right? I don't know yeah, if you have yeah. any thoughts on that. Yes, oh. the 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 tough thing with that is that I think there's a, there's always a process that's required to get to the right place, right? And that that journey so, is is actually a really useful one. So let, let me clarify this because I've just found I've just found the tweet. So it's, okay, it's by it. a guy called um, Jared Spool, yep. uh, JM Spool on Twitter. Uh, dashboards are often what customers ask for. They're rarely what customers need. 
If you're right. building a dashboard, it's likely your user research wasn't finished. And I was just like, yes, right? Yes. The, the, yes. The, thing, the thing you're trying to do isn't build a catch-all solution. The thing you're trying to do, and we've talked about this before, right, yeah. is trying to meet the user at the point where they have the question. Right. Right. You're trying to meet them at the point of delivery. Like, I, th I think the, the, the interesting thing here is a dashboard. Think about a dashboard on, on a car. Yeah. Why does revolutions per minute on every like car built from like 1990 to the last two years, why is it so big on the dashboard, right? And the fuel icon is so small and the engine oil, right? You've got all the, these four things that are standard on a car dashboard. All right. But for most people, all they care about is how fast they're going, how much fuel they've got left and oil and, and just an, an alert saying something's wrong. Right? right. Now, mod modern cars are doing this a bit better with digital dashboards, right? Where you can show, you can customize it to highlight the bit you want. Maybe you want your sat nav there. Maybe yep. you want your speedo there, right? Um, but that this entire concept of a dashboard is a fix is still a fixed piece of analysis, no matter how exploratory you make it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, that analogy is a good one, actually, because, you know, in an automatic car, why is the rev counter so prominent? You don't need to know because you've got an automatic car. And then you've an automatic car. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, right? You don't need to know what the rev counter is doing to get a visual cue of when to change gears unless it can do manual changes. But in a fully automatic car, there's just no need for that. And in an electric car, you guess the speedo is the most prominent thing. And actually, you just see a speedo. You, don't, you, get, a, you get some sort of visualization to tell you how much effort the car is putting but it's not a continuous scale it's just it's just like a, a, a like a almost like a progress bar as it were like here's zero yeah. effort and here's a hundred percent effort right um and that is an interesting sort of direction we're going i think the dashboard will just completely disappear in the car because you won't no longer need to be part of that process and going back to businesses like are we doing that process of trying to figure out okay we're just giving people dashboards but actually what if we just gave people the answer that they were asking like if, if the simple question is, what was the most uh, popular item this month? What if we just told them, oh, biscuits, and didn't give them the number behind that? Would that do, <laughs> exactly. the, would that exactly. do the job, or, right? Or, <laughs> and, and it will, right? Because th this, this is why, yeah. would, this, is, this is genuinely what I'm trying to work towards and trying to noodle in my head. Like, for me, in, you know, in the industry I'm going to work in, the point is never, can you build me something? The point is, can you get me the answer to this question to tell me if I'm right or wrong in my analysis, right? right? Anything I do will not, I don't want to say will not drive analysis because it will, but what it, what it more often than not does is augments it. And in, right. in business, that's the same, right? right. Now, the, the thing that I've got is everything's too late, right? Yeah. Everything is reactionary. Everything's in such a short space of time yeah. because it's elite sport. Now, in reality, what you have in business, uh, there's another thing I, I coined. Um, I've, this is one thing I've always wanted of, of, of like, skeleton to blog into this which is <laughs> everyone is questions rich but time poor right right and that right, is yeah. that is my thing against self-serve right yeah no one actually wants to self-serve self-service is a thing where you're just saying stop annoying me go annoy the computer right? go help that yourself. is what you're saying yeah. <laughs> go right? do one basically here's your, here's your buffet <laughs> pick out what you actually want to eat right right so yeah. so no one actually wants to self-serve so what you really want to do is just reduce the time to insight and, that, and what you just said is exactly correct. Right. Right. Yeah. What you want to be able to do is give the user choice, right? Everything comes down to this notion of choice. You want to say, if you want to find out what, what we're selling the most, it's biscuits. You want to find out why, here's the data, right? Yeah. Or here's the start of your analysis. And then yeah. it's like, the thing you want isn't so much um, the answer. It's here's the answer, but also here's me directing you and, and taking you on a journey to educate you on how to ask the question you're trying to answer. How yeah. do you articulate that? Yeah, no, 100%. And you you kind of get the impression that um, you know, Tableau is starting to think about this, you know, collections, uh, spaces, giving people places where these things can go, metrics, you know, just having numbers that basically answer certain questions. You're starting to see that actually they're getting this, right? So that, that technically means that people like myself and you are out of a job because what, well, not you, because you build, you, you're doing something sort of bigger. But me, if somebody builds a dashboard, <laughs> <laughs> technically I should be seeing the writing on the wall here and pivoting to, you know, being a server admin. Well, I am, but yeah, you know, you get my point. I shouldn't be <laughs> so focused on building dashboards and I should be more focused on building the platform on which this runs on, right? But I, th I think, I think you know, that there's still a place for, that there is always a place for data visualization, right? But I think what needs, what, what the next big leap in this space is, is augmented analytics, right? Is right. that the ability to create, I don't want to say self-service augmented analytics, but 
it's, it's not really self-serving, it's just easier, right? Like uh, right. Where, where Tableau made it so easy to build charts and iterate and fail fast and try again and build. And it still is, again, like we said, the best in class tool at doing that. Right. What, 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 what is the next big leap is improving and bringing these things close to home. And, and that's happening, right? And then Tableau's realized that, you know, we, we, they added comments. No one actually uses comments. Therefore, let, let, let's, let, let's let you collaborate where you collaborate. Let's push yeah. this thing, these things to Slack yeah. and make that easy to do. Yeah, and make notifications more prominent, let you take actions on those notifications, uh, update the comment window a little bit. Let's make you, let's find out ways to make it useful rather than just giving up because we didn't deliver this sort of version of what you were looking for. Um, and, and the other thing is, is <laughs> we are moving to a world where things need to be more integrated and actually Tableau has to start welcoming aspects of itself to other platforms, you know? And, and also invite, no, no, this is my favorite thing, right? This, yeah. this is, this is possibly one of the most interesting developments that I noticed last year. And it was, um, it was trying to understand more about how metrics works under the hood, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and what you realize when you start looking is it's JavaScript, yeah. right? It, it is a JavaScript element within Tableau Server. And you know, then you're like, hang on a second. If, if they're building a tool that is so smooth and ready to use as a really nice static visual experience that is metrics, that is able to pull from data within the server, be able to set permission, all these different things you can do. Mm -hmm. And you're suddenly taking something from the outside and putting it in here and creating a rich experience around it that is within the Tableau ecosystem. It's better than some of what if we you... have as well. <laughs> Correct. And then you start thinking, well, if you're doing that, what else can I do? What else can I do that starts to augment this? Now, what Tableau did that was quite smart was create the, this element of extensions. Now, there's all, obviously the most server admins in the global enterprise will never turn on extensions because of backdoors, uh, because you have a kitty GIF and then it's stealing your data in the background, right? That's that. that if you put that to one side and just think about <laughs> extensions as an element, as a tool to bring something outside of Tableau in yeah. to allow this integrated experience, as well as, as you said, taking the Tableau experience, putting it out. Mm -hmm. We talked, we, I mean, the embed SKU does this. Yeah. And there's such a, such a bigger picture and a bigger thing at play here that's easy to forget when you just look at devs at desk. Yeah, right? exactly. It's this whole modularization of the platform. Like I've always thought of it as you have a Broader JavaScript. Deeper, man. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you have something like the JavaScript API, which lets you uh, talk to a viz and read the data from a viz, and that's all well and great. Um, but imagine something even deeper. Let's say uh, they they do something like the VizQL API, right? Which um, whilst you're looking at a dashboard, <sighs> lets you just basically look at a dashboard normally. But imagine a VizQL API that allows you to pipe your own data into it and then out comes a visualization, mm -hmm. right? Like exact same template, exact same dashboard, but now you're piping instead of data from the database, you're piping data from a data model, same viz, and boom, it's, it comes to life. Or, you know, Hyper obviously has its own API, right? Modularizing these components that make Tableau what it is and then letting you intersect at any moment in that pipeline to say, actually, mm -hmm. thank you very much for what you've done so far. Now I'd like to do something more dynamic, for example, in D3. So VizQL talking directly to D3, no Tableau in between. That's a great sort of I, I, um, use case. Yeah. No, exactly. And I, I think that that's that would be... Without having to have trying... a server load of Viz in the first place, right? <laughs> I mean, and the, the assumption there is that is is that the VizQL element isn't, isn't still the secret source that drives everything that, you know, if Tableau opened up with an API, suddenly click in Power BI going to be rubbing their hands and being like, oh, but, but, finally. But why can't VizQL also work in the web? Like... It, it, you could just rewrite VizQL to work in a different world. It, it, what it's called doesn't matter. This is the way it does it, right? Visual query language. Yeah. That's all it actually is. Whether it does it on a on a JavaScript array or JSON object or a database or a SQL database or a nice, it doesn't matter. Who cares, right? It's just the concept. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. And I think, and I think that that direction is is super interesting when you start thinking about what is this tool going to look like in five years? Because like I've used it for five years. In that time, it's been reskinned. It's got two. It's got a new product added to the line. Well, two new products online as well. Um, it's it's got uh, expanded features. Like so many things have changed in just five years, mm -hmm. right? And you know now they've been bought out by uh, well, Salesforce, again a truly browser only web based platform, company. right? <laughs> exactly, and it's and a massive company to boot. And suddenly you've got this thing of like, okay, what is the direction it takes you on? I don't, I personally don't think. It'll be enveloped. I think Tableau is too big a brand for now. 
to, for it to be like sucked in. And I think Salesforce showed that with the Tableau CRM change. Yeah. But in terms of the direction, I think the interesting part will be how do you integrate all of these different good elements together? And how do you create something that is market leading even further than it is today, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, and I feel two ways about that. On one hand, I feel excited because there's a massive opportunity to make things better. I'd love the data armor connector in Tableau as a native connector. And then boom, suddenly you've just opened up a whole world of data sources that Tableau couldn't connect to. That's a great quality of life improvement, but that's like tier one integration. That's like basic integration. I like that thing over there, put it in my car, let's go. My car's better and faster now. Um, you could have done that anyway without buying a company, right? Um, tier two integration, which is like, you get the best minds from Tableau, you get the best minds from Salesforce, going across borders, seeing what uh, people are working on and creating new ideas. It's a fusion of both companies, right? And that's sort of tier mm -hmm. two integration. But that's not why companies merge. Companies merge because tier three integrations are where you put two companies together and then they create another company that eats both companies whole and creates a whole new business area and pushes it forward. Like that's basically what Disney and Pixar are like, right? Yeah, Disney bought Pixar and people thought, oh, great acquisition. No, that was a merger. Pixar had so much yep. to offer Disney and Disney had nothing, right? And, 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 and it's why Pixar is still a brand, right? It's Disney yes, Pixar, exactly, it's not Disney. Exactly, it's yeah. Disney Pixar because the Pixar exactly. brand is so powerful. Exactly. And so, you know, I think about what are the opportunities in that realm? For, 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 for both companies and that's what I hope I hope becomes sort of where they take it I get worried when we hear about the Salesforce 360 because all that says to me is you know, Salesforce Ohana. just wants <laughs> all that says all that says to me is Salesforce isn't actually interested in in the, the opportunities beyond just both companies obviously Salesforce is a much bigger company than Tableau much bigger customer yeah. base their customers are asking for certain things but there's there's more that could be done there. There's just more. It's just a lot more than just you know what um, uh, Salesforce CEO uh, what's his name first name Benioff. What's Mark his first Benioff. Name? Mark Benioff. Yeah. Mark. More than what Mark Benioff is talking about, which is just about you know providing the analytical capabilities that his Salesforce customers keep asking for, right? Well, why not go beyond that? You know, why why stop at just Tableau? Why not go beyond and into sort of cloud offerings and make it so that people don't have to deploy Tableau in AWS or Azure? Just give them that cloud platform that they can deploy in and don't give it Tableau online. Give them something that, you know, a server admin of today can go in, customize, set up and pay for in a completely separate process. And I think that, that might happen, right? Because you're always going to get the admin who's going to be like, yeah, but I want to look. Well, I want to integrate this back out. I want I want to get a server management api and, and suddenly you're going to be like this data dev element is just going to go boom, boom, boom. right right but what i mean by that is you know if i so if i give it a tableau example the classic tableau example is let me deploy tableau across different geographies without worrying about getting them in sync or backed up or whatever right let me, let me do like a geographical deployment like most cloud platforms can actually do and tableau can't right yeah the only way you do that in tableau is you deploy three servers you have some overnight syncing and you know every so often at least they're at least a day out of sync um and you know people have hacked custom things for that, but it's just it's just not out of the box. And people need this. You you see, you know what Tableau and Salesforce, or what hopefully Salesforce need to do with Tableau is you know bring in the kind of things that lots of IT admins have been asking for, and um, continuous integration and development sort of pipelines that allow to make it easier to collaborate, to do work and deploy and test in very dynamic ways. At the moment, you oh, have yeah, this, this. You have this world. That's CI/CD, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I laugh because <laughs> I just explained this to Ravi a minute ago. But anyway, um, it's a funny, it's a funny little, it's a funny world because, you know, if you say to someone you can't collaborate in a Tableau workbook, that's just completely foreign when you think of web development and the stuff that is innovative mm -hmm. in that space. Because yes, today in D3, I absolutely can do that. And today mm -hmm. in R, I can do that. And today in lots of different archaic things, <laughs> including SQL, I can do that, but I can't do it in the modern platform that's Tableau. And so you hope Salesforce really brings that through. But and I think the, the best place to start testing this, and I, I bang on about this so much, but the best place to test these things is Tableau Public, right? Like create, like it's the best place to start, you know, just say like, hey, we're thinking about doing things around collaboration and development. You know, you guys collaborate with each other to build visualizations. Do you want to test this out? And you, so, you then get like GitHub level forking and a lot that sort of, what's the word? Forking and splitting and all this stuff that you get in terms yeah. of um, sharing sharing content and you know, but this you is you suddenly get away from this element of someone stole my work. 
<laughs> I was about to say something along those lines. So this is where I think Tableau has to listen less to its community and listen more to those people who aren't part of the community and ask why aren't they part of it, right? Because if you listen to the Tableau community, no one's asking for CI CD pipelines, right? <laughs> but <laughs> but they want the you, opposite, right? Yeah, exactly. But if you actually listen listen to sort of the requirements that come through from, you know, people who have a lot of pain points with Tableau, um, this is something they ask for. And actually Tableau Public is a good place to test it, but it's not a good place to see how the idea sort of comes, it manifests, right? A great place test bed, but the ideas are not coming from the Tableau community in that sense. I'm 100% sure if I go to uh, Tableau Ideas page, I'll see something about CICD and it will have like 10 votes on it. <laughs> Whereas something like dynamic parameters will have a thousand, but then dynamic parameters are just like, in programming languages, that's just like well, a bunch of variables and if statements that are very easy to do. <laughs> so yeah. it's a, it's a very interesting sort of um, challenge they've got. I, I I just hope that in the next year or so, we see a, a much stronger intent from Salesforce about where they want to take Tableau. It's much stronger than where there we are today. Because at the moment, it feels like they're still in that courting stage. It's still like you're at a disco, you know, people are dancing and they haven't quite started to mix, right? Yeah. You, you picked out who you're going to talk to. You know their name. You're, you're building up the courage to go and talk to them. This is where everything feels like it's at. But what I'm hoping we get disco. next year is this. <laughs> I haven't been to one in probably over a decade, but I still remember what it felt like. And so it's a good analogy. So yeah, no, like I hope next year we see that actual statement of intent right this is what we believe tableau yeah. can do and not just i already think tableau know what they can do but i want to see what salesforce thinks tableau can do right because that's where the good thing can happen that's where the opportunities can happen um and to have it more than just be something like a plug-on for salesforce customers to to add on to their I, licenses I, I yeah. you know when we think about the the conversation we had earlier about business user and trying to deliver things at the time of insight salesforce does that kind of right like that's what I thought Einstein was, mm -hmm. right? It's this little thing that's understanding everything that's going on on Salesforce. And it's yeah. like understanding you as a profile user, it's understanding what you're looking at. Yeah. It's understanding people like you, it's understanding all the different things you're looking at, it's connecting all the dots, it's looking historically, it's doing machine learning yeah. and doing inverted commas. Um, <laughs> on all of these different things. And then it's being like, you probably should do this next, right? Right, right. And, and that's like delivering, almost trying to preempt and coach those questions out of the user. Now, if Tableau CRM still keeps that little guy and chucks him into Tableau mm -hmm. and starts to help prompt those questions, then suddenly, yeah, you know what? Bring back Clippy. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, well, give, give me Einstein and Tableau if he's going to help the user and guide them to better, more robust analysis. Because if the user is then able to say, that's not what I want to know, that's not what I want to know, oh, that's what I want to know, you're then coaching the questions. And then within, within the Tableau ecosystem and the industry and the people you're using, suddenly you've got a bank of questions that are very relevant, right? Yeah. I think the biggest sort of, uh, I don't want to say anti, but the, the naysayers of our data are always like, yeah, but the questions it has by default, they're never what I want to know. It's like, well, what if you can start capturing right. what it does want to know, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? You prompt and then you let, it's, it's, it's how normal machine learning and computer vision and stuff like that works. Yeah. You tell it yes and no, right? You, you create rules. And it goes off and... And it learns from those rules right. you're using neural network analysis. Indeed. And yeah, you know, uh, there's still so much hanging fruit as well in those worlds, right? Like you have a focus on Salesforce, blah, blah, blah. But there's also a bunch of opportunity in sort of uh, not automated analytics, but um, sort of IoT analytics. Uh, you do a lot of uh, sort of thinking about some of this stuff when it relates to how how necessarily your redacted sports, future tech, yeah, yeah, <laughs> redacted future tech. Um, how your sport sort of does its business, right? And it's it's an interesting question as to what I, what about that that aspect? What is Tableau doing yeah. to sort of innovate in that direction? Because that will become increasingly the area of analytics that generates the most data. And actually, if you don't pay attention to it, that is also an important aspect that we need to we need to be looking at. Because because you think about the broad picture about you know what does a data strategy look like? What what is what is the end goal? And the end goal is never that that data strategy becomes a really good thing. And it's never that you suddenly create an ecosystem where everyone's asking, answering questions. Right. The end goal is truly when you're not talking about data at all, it just becomes part of the conversation. Right. And everyone, instead of talking about data, they're just talking about insight and answers and questions. Like 
the, the year th th this is very much a time where people are almost bored of being told that data is the new oil it's change <laughs> yeah their life. yeah yeah all of these things right what what everyone knows that but what can i do with it what should i be doing with it there's no direction and directive in that space but that's why like when you're thinking about future tech and future space and you know what is the world going to look like and you're saying let's bring analytics to me you don't have to again like we said you bring it to where you collaborate you bring it to where you're you're working right you bring it to all these different things mm -hmm. um and you, and you you make it part of that conversation that's easy to follow uh, more than yeah. anything else I, I think i think the final part i want to add on there is um one of the python tutorials that i started and never finished after writing hello world was automate the hard things i right. think for me that is 100 percent the point of automation like just automate the stuff you don't want to do yeah so you can spend time doing stuff you do want to do right yeah and that's where that's where you don't want to be spending time doing data prep you just want it done for you right right that's what you want to truly get get to a point so you're not you don't have to think about data preparation data structure unless you really want to yeah you're just thinking about questions and you're getting answers that are, have roots in data with robust methodology 100 percent, 100 percent it's a tough it's a tough one to sort of round off i think uh, to be honest i don't know how many companies are have that level of thinking, right? I think every company is playing catch up in one way of well, in one way or another. And you sort of need an industry leader to show the example before other people sort of catch on and follow on. Um, and there's just not many, many people doing that unless you work in a statistical focus, like, you know, science organizations are really good at doing this. Research organizations and, and are good at doing this, but elsewhere business isn't just as good. Yeah. And, and also why would they share it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, if, if they're nailing they're it, why it really would they well. share it? Yeah. Yeah, true. Why, why would why why would they share it? Right? It's like, a big Palantir, competitive like, advantage. Uh, that, yeah, Palantir is that like dark, shady company that no one really knows what they do, but they kind of know what they do. Yeah, they just they've just like been at the bleeding edge of all all things future tech for a long time, and they've they've made a business out of it, right? So all of these different companies, if you're doing it well, why 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 would you talk about? Why would you publicize true. what you're doing well? In many ways, if you're talking about it publicly, then you're probably well behind the curve. Oh, 100 percent. What is it? Um. The, the, the concept of expected goals is a good one to, to, to use as an analogy here. The right. second that Arsene Wenger used it in a press conference and legitimized it, it's like, yeah, yeah, okay, cool. What are we doing next? Like, it was the, the point of, you know, bookies, be, like bookies had the models that was basically expected goals for a long time. It then became the, in the public sphere where it was talked about regularly. And then it's dead. It's like, cool, we're, we're, we're sorted. Like, yeah. the second it comes public, you realize this was two years, three years, four years ago. Right? Yeah. That everyone else was doing it. Mm -hmm. um it's kind of it's kind of like patents in a way right so, <laughs> speak of patents what do you make of the um apple apple announcements in the last couple of days oh interesting interesting um so 5g is it a big deal or not well i think in the uk it's not a big deal which probably like if you just take away 5g from the yesterday's announcement it, it was a fairly lackluster upgrade of a phone like it wasn't that it wasn't mm -hmm. that sort of blockbuster the, the improvements aren't the kind of improvements that every day, you know, Joe or Samantha is actually going to notice, <laughs> right? No one's recording mm -hmm. Dolby 10-bit color HDR 4K 60 FPS video every day of their baby farting in their face, right? Like, <laughs> it's just not... <laughs> You're you going to be a father in about two or three weeks, mate. Are you not going to be exactly. doing this? Uh, exactly, which is, which is exactly why I gave that example. Like, no one is recording anything at that level of detail. The simple <laughs> fact that it would just fill up your phone too quickly and leave alone, like you, you want to store memories, not freaking yeah. create like a video archive of, of you know, highest quality definition of it, uh, version of everything. Um, and then, you know, this whole environmental like bull crap about like, oh, we, we, we equated all the CO2 emissions that go into making the headphones and the power bank. And we realized that it's, 450,000 cars off the road. So we're not going to put it in the case for you, right? So it's like, okay, great. So now I pay the exact same price, not even cheaper price, exact same price for a lot less, okay? And what will probably end up happening is, yeah, when my charger breaks, as it does every year, I actually count on that replacement every year. <laughs> I personally will drive to the Apple store and buy it. So all you've done is not carbon offset it. You've actually distributed the carbon efficiency just across no, no, everyone they, they else. They have offset it 
but they've offset it to you. Yeah, it's so it's not much. them that right. feels crap right. about it. Right, it's you that feels crap about it. And then guess who's still selling a twenty pound power adapter? Oh, of course it's Apple. Yes, of course. So <laughs> I'll go to the Apple store and buy the thing I I should have had in my box, and you, you they'll just MagSafe? make more money. Go buy MagSafe. <laughs> exactly. Go buy MagSafe from us. Like no one else. It's proprietary connected. Look how amazing it is. Oh, by the way, we don't give it to you in the box. Honestly, it's just <laughs> such a load of tribe about the environment. Look, if you wanted to say you wanted to save on costs, just cut costs, keep the price the same, and let people be bitter about that. But don't try and guise it on this whole environmental thing. When like 450,000 cars off the road, great. Well, watch a million people go to the Apple store to buy the charger <laughs> that they should have had in their boxes, right? <laughs> well, just buy a cheaper charger that's going to ruin the battery. That too. Oh man, yeah, it's 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 a sort of a weird thing, you know. It, it, I think I think that's quite full circle, right? Because we've we've just talked about the fact that a lot of people found the Tableau features announcement quite lackluster, and it's like right, this right. isn't really yeah, for yeah. everyone. Yeah, and you know the consumer's not going to see the benefit, but a few other people will. Yeah, and so we've, we've I mean that's that's exactly what what this was, right? You suddenly maybe that's what twenty twenty tech is, right? You got Techtober at Tech Temba. Yeah, uh, coming up where you've got all these different things, uh, all these different technologies doing their release cycle. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I think this is what we're going to get. We're just going to get incremental hardware updates and not juicy bits for everyone to use. But I think Apple, um, Apple probably more so than other companies, the, the device they released today is actually not for the the world of today. It's for the world of two to three years from now. And because their phones last so long. Yeah, the iPhone they announced today needs to have features that in three, four years' time will be applicable, mm -hmm. right? Because if I, if, if I ask you, Ravi, what phone do you have now? iPhone XR. iPhone XR. That's what, two years old? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 20, exactly. yeah, two, yeah, two, two years old. Exactly. So the features Apple put into that phone two years ago are what you rely on day to day today and probably for the next year, right? And when you come to upgrade yeah. your phone in a year's time, the features in that iPhone you'll rely on for the next three years. But they, so, they did this with the watch, right? They did this exactly right. the same thing with the watch. If you've got a five, you're not going to buy the six. But if you've got a three, you should buy the six. Exactly, right? exactly. And so the, the, the today's announcement or yesterday's announcement wasn't for people who have an iPhone 11 Pro, although the suckers who love the best and latest will still go and buy the new thing, like me. But for most people, <laughs> for most people, there's no reason to upgrade if you got a phone last year or even the right. year before that, right? And, and, and I think Apple's starting to acknowledge that. And that is actually how their strategy is sort of going forward. It speaks to the interesting fact that when they do the demos, they don't have many use cases for things like LiDAR. They know the implications. They know where it's going to be valuable. But fundamentally, the developers haven't got hold of the devices to build the things that would be actually useful in two to three years' time when everyone has that as a mainstream device. So you have to start putting it in devices today so that in two years' time, it's a mainstream thing. And that's where like WWDC is more perhaps more interesting Correct, than yeah. the Apple product launches these days, right? Yeah. Because you're really interested in what tools are you giving developers to play with this, right? App clips, for example, right? Yeah. App clips I think are going to be really, really useful, especially in the 5G world. Um Pardons. but also oh, man. That, that needs that like, kind of feature. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, and but like things like that. What, what else was there? The um the 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 code code base that you can now use on Mac iOS Mac OS and iOS. Swift. Simon Swift. Uh, Swift, yeah, I think there's a different name for it though, because uh, it was a new code base that, oh, that was able Swift to UI. cargo. Swift UI. Co yeah. It used to be Coffee, and then um, Coffee Script yeah. or something like that, and now it's uh, Swift UI, which allows you to write an interface once and deploy it across the entire platform. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like um, that, that will allow more users to build more, but then also take advantage of the hardware. Right again. Right. It, it's it's a really smart thing. Like the 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 last two years for Apple, I think, have been, I guess, my, my comparison is the iPhone 6 and 7. Right, right. Right. They're not big leaps, but we're, we're building up to the notchless phone. Right. That's yeah. why we're going to give you one thing every year, but we're going to go from the 5, which was a great phone, like possibly the best looking phone to, until this one. Right. So we're going for the 5, we're going to skip the 6 and 7 and 8 because they're basically the same. And You're going to get a nice camera, nice inside. And then we're going to hit you with the 10. Right. Now we're in and the 10. And then we're going to give you the 10. 10 World, we've got 10, 11, 12, X, X, 10R, uh, SE for those who want to stay on like just a smaller phone. And I'm going to hit you with this one, which is notchless with the bezels. And it's going to look good. And touch right? ID and... under the screen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and then no suddenly you're now. 
and exactly and, and then you know, in, in, two, in next year or the year after you're going to get touch ID under the screen similar to what you got on the iPad Air and you're probably going to get USB-C yeah. I want 3D touch back honestly there's one hack I love that they took away from me in fact in my Apple Watch Series 4 not only did they take it away from me they disabled it from me like that's I bought that watch with a feature and they took it away in an iOS update. How dare they? Honestly, like, I, 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 don't, I don't even know if that's legal. Is that even allowed? Like, I buy a watch. <laughs> I buy a watch with a sensor that allows me to force touch it. And then in an update, they take that feature away. So it still has the ability to do that. But now it just doesn't work. Like, Listen, who what, does that? What? what? What I reckon you should do is um, write email to Epic Games and just tack this onto the bottom of their right. class action lawsuit. Can you slip this in? Yeah. And while you're at it, can you <laughs> slip this one in? Yeah. Well, yeah. While you're going at, at the microtransactions on the App Store, can we just go and attack in? Are you allowed to take away tech from me? <laughs> yeah, through a feature up, uh, a software update. A software update that removes features. Like, honestly, it's just... I don't know how that just went <laughs> unnoticed, right? Like, it just... It was a feature of the watch, a hardware feature. I bought the watch and they took it away with a software update. Honestly. Oh, anyway, you can tell I'm not bitter at all about that. I've got a Series 6 now that I've gotten used to not force touching uh, everything, but it took ages to get out the muscle memory for that. Um, but I want them to bring that back. Uh, touch ID. Well, <laughs> I think this year proves that they need to bring Touch ID because <laughs> I don't know how many people go to unlock their phone with Face ID and it's like, eh, eh. like <laughs> Yeah. Bring Touch ID back. And, uh, and the, the annoying part isn't that it goes, uh -uh. it's like you have to wait three times before it lets you put your passcode. Yeah, in. yeah. It, it does get there faster, to be fair. It does get there faster. Like, um, I notice when I go to do these payments, it does actually get there faster. But if you do, uh, like, unlocking your phone, it tries three times, then it will do that. But if you, the hack is to do uh, double tap for a payment, that will give you the passcode straight away. And then you swipe your way and then you go back. And this, is, this is what we have to do, man. It's just the way it is. Um, so yeah, bring back Touch ID. They've got it on the iPad Air, so it's clearly possible, right? And it's so clearly the iPad, possible. The iPad Air has Touch ID, but no Face ID, which is weird. Um, so I, I thought I, Face I, ID was I the greatest like the, thing um, ever. And they, they took it away yeah, from the well, iPad Air. <laughs> the iPad Air is another great tablet, right? Like suddenly you've got the form and function of an iPad Pro. Without promotion. Price point. Without promotion, which most people won't recognize, but yeah. If you if you Without draw with the Apple and, pencil, and spatial sound. Yeah, if you draw with the Apple yeah. pencil, you'll notice promotion. But if you don't, then you won't. I have no idea what you're talking about, and I've got a pro. <laughs> <laughs> so you have no idea what I'm talking about. But go go look at an iPad that doesn't have it, and you'll know what I'm talking about straight away. It's obviously to do with the screen. So I won't even tell you what it is. I just see next time you're in an Apple store, which won't be for a while, <laughs> or next time you see a, <laughs> next time you see an oh, iPad. Actually, yeah. I can I can do this. I can do this. I've got I've got a um I've got a spare air. Right, right, exactly. So open that up, put them side to side, go to a web page and scroll. Tell me what you see. Right. There we go. <laughs> Homework. <laughs> For the next episode of Dragon Ball Z. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know why Dragon Ball Z what came into show. my mind. But yes, uh next episode of the podcast, which we'll probably better start a new ne season, Abby. Yeah, I think that this, what we we made a joke on during the watch line. We were like, we, we should just start a new season because the second we start lapsing in doing them and the gaps get bigger and bigger between podcasts, like let's start a new season. This is when you exactly. this is when you renew. I can't wait for the season to get to fifty two weeks. Then it'll be like, oh, okay, <laughs> we've made it a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, it's twenty four because we um, don't do one every week. But yeah. Oh god! No, no absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, we we basically need to get back on the bandwagon. I think this is winter. This is a winter seasonal podcast. Though, as soon as summer comes, things get busy. You change jobs. I have kids. You know, it's just, <laughs> it just gets too busy for us to keep the sort of momentum. So it makes sense that it's about time we start a new season going into the. And, into and the I winter. think you're absolutely right. You know, when you have a kid, you're going to have so much spare time. You know, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, just listen, I might be doing a podcast with the, the next time. Uh, sorry, the next time we talk, I might be doing a podcast with the baby in my arms. Honestly, it's that close. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Good stuff. Yeah, so I, th I think, yeah, let, let, let's, call, let's call this the end of season. Um, I think what we can do, we've got a couple of uh, ideas in, on guests to bring in. I think we had uh, Gwilym and Kent earlier on this year. Yeah. Uh, Kent Martin and Gwilym Locke were talking about eth data ethics as well as um, uh, Kent talking about his life as a 
as a um, as a Tableau developer. He's, he's moved on to Elastic Search Elastic, now. Yeah. Uh, who've got the conference today. Um, but yeah, we, we've got a couple of people lined up that we're going to speak to. Hopefully, to not 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 really get an inside track on what, what's happening at Tableau, but more more so like understand the thinking mm-hmm. and the sort of planning and things like that. Similar to what we talked to Kent about, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so hopefully we can get into those and then um yeah it's it's you know i think i think one of the things we talked about after the watch along was possibly doing a video version of these um yeah yeah well where, where we we've done one live episode where we just record like went live and then recorded ourselves chatting yeah. which then turned yeah. into the actual podcast but um yeah we might do something like that but um let us know if you've got something that you're interested in doing or seeing um uh yeah let us know and, and we'll try and tr- squeeze it into the next season but i've got an awesome no doubt, idea think... we should we should Stream and watch the Power BI keynote. Ooh. <laughs> so it's already happened yeah, for the that record. Could be interesting, but we could play it as if it's live and then just comment because I haven't actually watched it. But we should do this That's for really loads of other analytics products and just see how, how that goes down. <laughs> yeah, you know what? That's not a terrible idea at all. I, I like that. Just just watching back on maybe maybe even, oh, let's let's throw in some Chabot old school. <laughs> Christian Chabot <laughs> keynotes where we can just lament on how great a speaker he was and like the ideas he got going with you. So, you know, the reason I suggest this is because uh, there's obviously quite a few Power BI YouTube personalities, and uh, there is one whose uh, video about Tableau I highly despise because it's the most one sided assessment of Tableau I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, but yes, um, if we start with a live stream, we might then be able to sort of pull in the, the Power BI fanboys uh, to engage in our in our podcast a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, give, give us some heat, as it were. <laughs> no, and I, I think that, that I, I, I'd enjoy that as a conversation, though. Um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Get, get, get something on so far the other way. <laughs> Well, I, I like to think of myself as a relatively rational person, um, <laughs> but I do have a lot of ammunition against Power BI from my previous job at Till. I might just cut out that snippet and put it at the start of the podcast as the intro, and then I'll <laughs> yeah, yeah. get straight into it. <laughs> Good stuff. Right. Okay, cool. We have, a, we have a plan for the next uh, sort of season of content. Stay tuned for that. We'll obviously try and do that very, very, very soon. Otherwise, uh, thank you for listening to this whole season. It's been uh, great to yeah. have a whole world of new listeners as well. Uh, Ravi as ever. It's been a great hosting the podcast with you. Thank you for not leaving me Always. on my lonesome when you left me <laughs> professionally uh, <laughs> uh, in, in, in many ways. So yeah, um, hopefully next season uh, we can we can balance the books a little bit. Uh, Excellent. You, nice uh, one. Take care, everyone, and uh, we'll speak to you soon. <laughs>